Chapter 2 Roast Mutton Up jumped Bilbo, and putting on his dressing gown, went into the dining room. There he saw nobody, but all the signs of a large and hurried breakfast. There was a fearful mess in the rooms, up in piles of unwashed crocks in the kitchen. Nearly every pot and pan he possessed seems to have been used. The washing up was so dismally real that Bilbo was forced to believe the party of the night before had not been part of his bad dreams, as rather he had hoped. Indeed, he was rather really relieved, after all, to think that they were all gone without him, and without bothering to wake him up. But never without, with never a thank you, he thought. And yet, in a way, he could not help feeling just a trifle disappointed. The feeling surprised him. Don't be a fool, Bill O'Baggins, he said to himself, thinking of dragons and all that outlandish nonsense at your age. So he put on a nice apron, lit fires, boiled water, and washed up. Then he had a nice little breakfast in the kitchen before turning out the dining room. By the time the sun was shining and the front door was open, letting in a warm spring breeze, Bilbo began to whistle loudly and to forget about the night before. In fact, he was just sitting down to have a nice little second breakfast in the dining room by the window when in walked Gandalf. "'My dear fellow,' he said, "'whenever are you going to come? What about an early start? And here you are, having breakfast, or whatever you call it, at half-past ten. They left you a message, because they could not wait. What message? said, said Mr. poor Mr. Baggins, all in a fluster. Great elephant, said Gandalf. You are not at all yourself this morning. You never dusted the mantelpiece. Well, what's that got to do with it? I have enough to do with washing up for fourteen. If you had dusted the mantelpiece, you would have found just, just under the clock, said Gandalf, handing Bilbo a note. Which didn't of course on his own notepaper. This is what it read. Thorn and company to burglar Bilbo greetings. For your hospitality and sincerest thanks, for your offer of professional assistance and our grateful, uh, our grateful acceptance. Terms. Cash on delivery up to and not exceeding one fourteenth of total profits, if any. All traveling expenses guaranteed in any event. Funeral expenses to be defrayed by us or our representatives, if occasion arises and the matter is not otherwise arranged for. Thinking it unnecessary to disturb you in your esteemed repose, we proceed in advance to make requisite preparations and shall wait for you in person at the Green Dragon Inn, by water, at 11 a.m. sharp. Thrusting, you will be punctual. We have an honor, we have on the honor to remain, yours deeply. Thorn and Company. That just leaves you ten minutes. You'll have to run, said Gandalf. But, said Bilbo, no time for that either. Off you go. To the end of his days, Bilbo never could remember how he found himself outside, without a hat, a walking stick, or any money, or anything he usually took when he went out. Leaving his second breakfast half-finished and quite unwashed up, putting his keys into Gandalf's hands and running as fast as Furry's feet could carry him down the lane, past the great mill across the water, and then on for a mile or more. Very puffed he was when he got to buy water just on the stroke of eleven, and found that he had come without pocket handkerchief. Bravo, said Bolin, who was standing outside the inn door looking out for him. Then all the others came round at the corner of the road from the village. They were on ponies, and each pony slung with all sort of baggages, packages, parcels, and paraf paraphernalia. It was a very small pony, apparently for Bilbo. Up you two get, and off we go. I, I, I'm awfully sorry, said Bilbo, but I've come without my hat, and I left my pocket handkerchief behind, and I haven't got any money. I didn't see your note until after 10.45, to be precise. Don't be precise, said Dwallin, and don't worry. You'll have to manage out pocket handkerchiefs and a good many other things before we get to the journey's end. As for a hat, I have a spare hood and cloak in my luggage. And that's how they all came to a start, jogging off from the inn one fine morning before May, on laden ponies, and Bilbo was wearing a dark green hood, a leather weather stained, and a dark green cloak borrowed from Dwallin. They were too large for him, and he looked rather comic. 
What his father Bungo would have thought of him, I daren't stay. His only comfort was he couldn't be mistaken for a dwarf, as he had no beard. They had not been riding long when up came Gandalf on a very splendid white horse. He brought a lot of pocket handkerchiefs, a Bilbo's pipe, and tobacco. So, after the party went along very merrily, they told stories or sang songs as they rode forward all day. Except, of course, when they stopped for meals. These didn't come quite as often as Bilbo's would have liked them, but he still began to feel that the adventures were not so bad after all. At first they had passed through Hobbit lands, a wide, respectable country inhabited by decent folk, with good roads, an inn or two, and every now and then a dwarf or farmer ambling on business. Then they came to lands where people spoke strangely and sang songs Bilbo had never heard before. Now they had gone far, on far into the lone lands, where there were no people left, no inns, and the roads grow steadily worse. Far ahead were dreary hills and rising higher and higher, dark with trees. On some of them were old castles that looked evil, as if they were built by wicked people. Everything seemed, everything seemed gloomy, for the weather that day had taken a very nasty turn. Mostly it had been good as may can be, and even in merry tales, but now it was cold and wet. In the lone lands, they had been obliged to camp what they could, but at least it had been dry. To think that it will soon be June, grumbled Bilbo, as he splashed around behind the others in a very muddy track. It was after tea time, and it was pouring with rain, and they had been all day. His hood was dripping into his eyes, his cloak was full of water, and the pony was tired and stumbled on stones. The others were grump too grumpy to talk. And I'm sure the rain has gone to the dry clothes and into the food bags, thought Bilbo. Bother burgling and everything to do with it. I wish I was home in my night's hole by the fire with a kettle just beginning to sing. It was not the last time he had wished this. Still the dwarfs jogged on, never turning round or taking any notice of the hobbit. Somewhere behind the grey clouds the sun must have gone down, for it was beginning to grow very dark as they went down to the deep valley with a river at the bottom. Wind got up, and willows along its banks bent and sighed. Fortunately, the road went over the ancient stone bridge, for the river, swollen of rains, came rushing down from the hills and mountains in the north. It was nearly night when they had crossed over. The wind broke up in grey clouds, and the wandering moon appeared above the hills between the flying rags. Then they stopped and Thorin muttered something about supper. And where shall we get a dry patch to sleep on? Not until then did they notice that Gandalf was missing. So far he had come with them all this way, never saying if he was in for the adventure or merely keeping them company for a while. He had eaten most, talked most, and laughed most. And now he was simply not there at all. Just when a wizard would have been most useful to groaned Dory and Nori, shared the hobbit's views about regular meals, plenty and often. They decided in the end they would have camp where they were. They moved to a clump of trees, though it was drier under them, the wind shook the rain off the leaves, and the drip, drip, drip was most annoying. Also, the mischief seemed to get into the fire. Dwarves can make a fire almost anywhere, almost out of anything, no wind or no wind, but they could not do it that night not even with Owen and Glowen, who were especially good at it. Then one of the ponies took fright at nothing and bolted. He got into the river before they could catch him, and before they could get him out again, Feely and Keely were nearly drowned, and all the baggage that he had carried had washed away with him. Of course, it was mostly, it was mostly food, and there was mine will left for supper, and less for breakfast. There they all sat glum, wet, and muttering, while Owen and Glowen went on trying to light the fire and quarrelling about it. Bilbo was sadly reflecting that adventures were not all pony rides in May sunshine, when Balin, who always was their lookout, man, said, There's a light over there. There is a hill some ways off with trees on it, pretty thick in these parts. Out of the dark, the mass of trees, they could now see a light shining, a reddish, comfortable-looking light, might be a fire or torches twinkling. 
When they had looked as it, at it for some while, they felt to, to arguing. Some said no, some said yes. Some said they could go, but but go and see, and anything better would be than, and anything was better than a little supper, less breakfast, and wet clothes all the night. Others said, these parts are none well too known, and too near the mountains. Travelers seldom come this way now. The old maps are no use. Things have changed for the worse, and the road is unguarded. They have seldom ever heard of king round here, and the less inquisitive you are as you go along, the less trouble you, there are, you are likely to find. Some said, after all, there are fourteen of us. Others said, where has Gandalf got to? This remark was repeated by everyone. Then the rain began to pour down even worse than ever, and Owen and Glowen began to fight. That settled it. After all, we got a burglar with us, they said, and they made off, leading their ponies, with all due and proper caution, in the direction of the light. They came to the hill and were soon up in the wood. Up the hill they went, but there was no proper path to be seen, such as it might lead to a house or farm, but they could do with a great deal of rustling and cracking and creaking, and a good deal of grumbling and dratting as they went through the trees in the pitch dark. Suddenly, the red light shone out very bright through the tree chunks, not far ahead. Now it is the burglar's turn, they said, meaning Bilbo. You must go in and find out all about all that light, and what is it for, and if it's all perfectly safe and canny, said Thorin, to the hobbit. Now scuttle off and come back quick, and if all is well, if, uh, if not, come back if you can. If you can't, twice like a barn owl, and once like a screech owl, and we will do what we can. Off Bilbo had to go, for we could explain that he could not even hoot like once like any sort of owl, more than fly like a bat. Uh, but at any rate, hobbits can move quietly in woods, absolutely quietly. They take pride in it, and Bilbo had sniffed more than once what he had called all this dwarvish racket as he went along. I don't suppose you and I would have noticed anything at all about it on a windy night, not if the whole cavalcade had passed two feet of up, two feet off. As for Bilbo walking prim primly towards the red light, I don't even suppose a weasel would have stirred a whisker at it. So naturally he got right up to the fire, for fire it was without disturbing anyone, and this is what he saw. Three very large persons sitting round a large file of beech logs. They were toasting muttons on long spits of wood and licking gravy off their fingers. There was a fine tooth, tooth st uh, some smell, and there was a barrel of good drink at hand, and they were drinking out of jugs. But they were trolls. Obviously trolls. Even Bilbo, in spite of his sheltered life, could see that, even from the great fist, heavy faces of them, and their size, and the shape of their legs, not to mention their language, which was not drawing-room fashion after all. Mutton yesterday, mutton today, and blimey, if it doesn't look like mutton again tomorrow, said one of the trolls. Never a blinking bit of man flesh we had for a long time, said a second. We are well tell him Willen was a thinking of some that bring us in these parts at all, and beats me. The drink was running short, and what's more, he said, jogging the elbow of William, who was taking a pull at his jug. William choked. Shut your mouth, he said as soon as he could. You can't expect folk to stop here for just every when by you and Bert. You've eat a village and a half between you, and since you've come down from the mountains, how much more do you want? Time, and the time's been up our way, when you've said, Thank you, Burr, for a nice bit of fallon, fat valley mutton like we're had that it is. He took a big bite off of sheep's leg he was roasting, and wiped his lips on his sleeves. Yes, I am afraid that trolls do behave like that, even ones with only one head each. After hearing all this, Bobo ought to have done something at once. Either should have gone back quietly and warned his friends that, were th that there were three fair-sized trolls at hand in a nasty mood, quite like uh, quite likely to try roasted dwarf, or even pony for a change, or else had done a bit of 
quick, quick, quick burglaring. A good first class and legendary burglar would have at this point picked the troll's pockets. It's nearly always worth a while if you can manage it. Pinched the very mutton off the spence, purloined the beer, and walked off without them noticing. Others more practical but less professional pride would perhaps have stuck a dagger into each of them before they observed it. Then the night could have been spent cheerily. Bilbo knew it. He had read some good of many things, like he had ever seen or done. He was very much alarmed, and as well as disgusted. He wished himself a hundred miles away. And yet, and yet somehow, he could not go straight back to Thorin, and the company empty-handed. So he stood and hesitated in the shadows. Of the very burglar's proceedings he had heard of, picking the troll's pocket seemed the least difficult. So he had crept behind a tree just behind William. Bert and Tom went off to the barrel, William having another drink, and then Bilbo picked up the courage and put out his little hand into William's enormous pocket. There was a purse in it, as big as a bag as Bilbo. Huh, he thought he, warming to his new work as it lifted it carefully out. This is the beginning. It was. Troll's purposes are, uh, purses are the mischief, and there's no exception. Hey, who are you? It squeaked as it left the pocket, and William turned round at once and grabbed Bilbo by the neck before he could duck behind the tree. Blimey, Bert, look what I've cooked, said William. What is it, said the others, caught me up. Let me, if I know, what are you? Um, B -b -b Bilbo Baggins, a, a, b -b a hobbit, said Bilbo, shaking all over and wondering how to make owl noises before they throttled him. A burb hobbit? they asked, a bit startled. Trolls are slow in the uptake, and mighty suspicious around anything new to them. What's a burb a hobbit got to do with my pockets anyway? said William. And can you cook em? said Tom. You can try, said Pert, picking up a skewer. He wouldn't make em above a mouthful, said William, who already had a fine supple supper. No, not when he was skin boned. Perhaps there's more of them around, and we might make a pie, said Bert. Here are you. Are there any more of your sort sneaking around in these woods? You're a nasty little rabbit. He and he said, looking at the hobbit's furry feet, then picked him up by the toes and shook him. Yeah, yeah, yes, lots, said Bilbo, before he remembered not to give his friends away. No, none at all, not one, he said immediately afterwards. What do you mean, said Bert, holding him right back up? By his hair this time. Oh, what I say, said Bilbo gasping. And please don't cook me, kind sirs. I'm a good cook myself, and cook better than I cook, if you see what I mean. I'll cook beautifully for you, a perfectly beautiful breakfast for you, if you only wouldn't have me for supper. Poor little bird, a bird blighter, said William. He always had a bunch of uh, supper as he could, and already had lots of beer. Poor little blighter, let him go. Not till he tells him says what he means by lots and not at all, said Bert. I don't want to have me throat cut and me sleep. Hold his toes in the fire till he talks. I won't have it, said William. I caught him anyway. You're a fat fool, William, said Bert. And I've seen this afore all evening. And you're a lout. And I won't take that from you, Bill Huggins, said Bert. And he put a fist in Will William's eye. Then there was a gorgeous row. Bilbo had just enough wits left when Bert dropped him on the ground to scuttle out of the way of their feet before they were fighting like dogs and calling all one another all sorts of perfectly true and epical names in their very loud voices. Soon they were locked in one other's arms, rolling and nearly into the fire, kicking and thumping, while Tom whacked them both with a branch to bring them to their senses, and that of course only made them madder than ever. That would have been the time for Bilbo to have left. But four little feet had been very squashed by Bert's big paw, and he had no breath in his body, and his head was going round, so he there lay there for a while panting, just out of the circle of the firelight. Right in the middle of the fight came Balin. The dwarves heard noises from a distance, and waited for some time for Bilbo to come back, or to hoot like an owl. And they started off one by one to creep towards the light as quietly as they could. No sooner did Tom see Balaam come into the light than he gave an awful howl. 
trolls simply detest the very sight of dwarves, uncooked. Bert and Bill stopped fighting immediately, and said, A sark, Tom, quick, they said. Before Balin, who was wondering where all this commotion Bilbo was, knew what he was doing, a sack was over his head, and he was down. There's more to come yet, said Tom, or I'm a mighty mistook. Lots and none at all what is, he said. No Burba hobbits, but a lot of these here dwarves. That's about the shape of it. I reckon you're right, said Bert. We'd best get out of the light. And so they did with sacks in their hands and what they used for carrying off mutton and under plunder. They waited in the shadows. As each dwarf came up and looked at the fire and the spilled jugs and the gnawed mutton, in surprise, pop, went a nasty smelling snack over their head, and down he, he was down. Soon Dwalin lay by Balin and Feely and Keely together, and Dory and Nori and Ori all in a heap, and Owen and Glowin and Biffer, Bofar, Bombar piled uncomfortably near the fire. That'll teach him, said Tom, for Biffer and Bofer had given them a lot of trouble, and fought like mad, as dwarves will when cornered. Thorin came last, and he was caught, caught under one of ears. He came expecting mischief, and didn't need to see his friend's legs sticking out of sacks to tell them when things were not all well. He stood outside the shadows of some way off, and said, What's with all this trouble? Who's been knocking my people about? It's trolls, said Bilbo from behind the tree. They had forgotten all about him. They're hiding in the bushes with sacks. Oh, are they? said Thorin, and he jumped forward to the fire before they could leap on him. He caught up a big branch on the fire on one end, and Bert got the end in his eye before he could step aside. That put him out of the battle for a bit. Bilbo did his best. He got hold of Tom's leg as well as it could. Uh and it was thick as a young tree trunk. But he spent spinning up into the top of some bushes when Tom kicked his sparks up in Thorn's face. Tom got the branch in his teeth for that and lost one of the front ones. It made him howl, I can tell you. For he lost one of the front, front ones. Er, but just at that moment, William came up behind and popped a sack right over Thorn's head and down to his toes. And so the fight ended. A nice pickle they were all in now, all neatly tied up in sacks, with three angry trolls, and two of Burns and Bashes to, Burns and Bashes to remember, sitting by them, arguing whether to roast them slowly, or mince them fine and boil them, or simply sit on them one by one and squash them into jelly. And Bilbo up in a bush, with his clothes and skin torn, not daring to move far, fearing they should hear them. It was just then that Gandalf came back, but no one saw him. The trolls had just decided to roast the dwarves now and eat them later. That was Bert's idea, and a lot of arguing, and after a lot of arguing, had they all agreed to it. No good roasting them now. We'll take all night, said a voice. Um, Bert thought it was Williams. Don't start that argument all over again, Bill, he said, or we'll take all night. It was arguing, said William, who thought it was Bert had spoken. You are, said Bert. You're a liar, said William, and so the argument began all over again. And in the end, they decided to mince them fine and boil them. Soon they got a great back pot and took out their knives. No good boiling them. We got no water, and it's a long way to the well and all, said a voice. Bert and William said thought it was Tom's. Shut up, said they said. Well, we'll never have it done. You can fetch the water yourself if you say any more. Shut up yourself, said Tom, who thought it was William's voice. Who's been arguing about you? I'd not like to know. You're a booby. Booby yourself, said Tom. And so the argument began all over again, and they went on hotter than ever, then they at last decided to sit on the sacks one by one and squash them and boil them next time. Who shall we sit on first, said the voice. Better sit on that flask fellow first, said Bert, whose eye had been damaged by Thorin. He thought Tom was talking. Don't talk to yourself, but if he wants to sit on the last one, sit on him. Which is he? The one with the yellow stockings, said Bert. Nonsense. It's the one with the grey stockings, said a voice like William's. I made sure it was yellow, said Bert. Yellow it was, said William. Then what'd you say it was grey for, said Bert? I never did. Tom said it. 
<laughs> I, I, I never did, said Tom. It was you. Two to one, so shut your mouth, said Bert. Who are you talking to, said William. Now stop it, said Tom and Bert together. The night's getting on and dawn comes early. Let's get on with it. Dawn take you all and be stoned to you, said a voice that sounded like William's. But it wasn't. For just that moment the light came over the hill, and was a mighty twitter in the branches. William never spoke, for as he turned to stone as he stood, and Bert and Tom were stuck like roots as they looked at him. As they stand, and there they stand to this day, all alone, unless birds perch on them, for trolls, as you probably know, must be underground before dawn, or else they go back to the stuff of the mountains they are made of, and never move again. This is what happened to Bert and Tom and William. Excellent, said Gandalf, as he stepped from behind a tree and helped Bilbo to climb down out of a thorn bush. Then Bilbo understood. It was the wizard's voice that they kept the trolls bickering and quarreling until the light came and made the end of them. The next thing was to untie the sacks and let out the dwarves. They were nearly suffocated and very annoyed, and they had not at all enjoyed lying there listening to the trolls make plans for roasting them and squashing them and mincing them. They had to hear Bilbo's account of what happened to them twice over before they were satisfied. <laughs> Silly time to go prancing, pitching, and pickpocketing, said Bomber, when, when, when what we wanted was fire and food. And just the time, um, and that's just what you would have gone out of these fellows without a struggle, in any case, said Gil Gandalf. And how are you wasting time now? Did you realize that the trolls must have a cave or hole dug somewhere to hide from the sun in? We must go looking for it. They searched about, and soon found the marks of the trolls' stony boots going away from the trees. They followed the tracks up the hill until, they, until, hidden by bushes, they came on a big door of stone leading to a cave. But they could not open it, not until they all pushed while Gandalf tried various incantations. Would this be any good? asked Bilbo, for when they were getting tired and angry. I found it on the ground when there were trolls had their fight. He held out a largest key, with no doubt William had thought it was a very small and secret. It must have fallen out of his pocket, very luckily, for it was turned to stone. Why on earth didn't you mention that before, they cried. Gandalf grabbed it and fitted it to the keyhole, and the storm drill door swung back open with one big push. Then they all went inside. There were bones on the floor, and a nasty smell was in the air. But there was a great good food deal of food, jumbled carelessly on shelves and on the ground, among an untidy tidy letter, litter of plunder, from all sorts of brass buttons to pots full of gold coins standing in a corner. Of clothes, too. It's hanging on walls, too small for trolls, and I am afraid they belong to victims, along with them several swords of various makes, shapes, and sizes. Two caught their eye, particularly because of their beautiful scabbards and jeweled hilts. Kandolf and Thorin each took these, one of these, and Bilbo took a knife in the leather sea sheath. It would have been only a tiny pocket knife for a troll but it was good as a short sword for the hobbit. These make good blades, said the wizard, half drawing them and looking at them curiously. They were not made by any troll, nor any among smith among men around these parts and days. But when we can read the runes on them, we shall know more about them. Let's get out of this horrible smell, said Feely. So they carried out the pots of coins and such food that was untouched and looked fit to eat, also one barrel of ale which was still full. By the time they felt like breakfast, and very, being very hungry, they did not turn their nose up at what they had got from the troll's larder. Their own provisions were very scanty. Now they had bread and cheese, plenty of ale, and bacon to toast in the embers of the fire. After they had slept, for their night had been disturbed, and they did nothing more till afternoon. Then they brought up their ponies, carried away large pots of gold, and buried them very secretly, not far from the track by the river, putting a great number of many number of spells over them, just in case there ever came the chance to come back and recover them. When that was done, they all mounted once more, and jogged east along the path onward toward the east. "'Where did you go to, if I may ask?' asked Thornton, said Gandalf, as they rode back. "'To look ahead,' said he. And what brought you back to the nick of time? Looking back, he said. Exactly, said Thorin. 
What could you be more plain? I went on to spy on a road. It will soon become dangerous and difficult. Also, I was anxious about replenishing our small stock of provisions. I had not gone very far, however, when I met a couple of friends of mine from Rivendell. Where's that? said Bilbo. Don't interrupt, said Gandalf. You'll get there in a few days now, if we're lucky, and you'll find out all about it. As I was saying, I met two of Elrond's people. They were hurrying along for fear of trolls. It was they who told me of three of them that had come down from the mountains and settled in the woods not far from the road. They had frightened everyone away from the district and the waylaid strangers. I immediately had a feeling that I was wanted back. Looking behind, I saw a fire in the distance and made for it. So now you know. Please be more careful next time, or she'll never get anywhere. Thank you, said Thorin.